And I'd love if you can just start by telling us a little bit about what you do and tell us about your journey to doing a PhD in biology. So my name is Cassandra Ford. Uh, I am a PhD candidate at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. I am looking at the evolution of head and skull shape in electric fish from South America and Africa. Uh, so getting to this point, it definitely wasn't a straight shot by any means. I have always loved animals and biology classes were always my favorite. In my mind, I thought that kind of the career paths that you could take in science were all of the like professional jobs. So like doctor, dentist, <laughs> uh, veterinarian. So loving animals, being a vet was always kind of what I thought I needed to go toward. Uh, but pretty quickly, I realized that that was not the career for me. Um, it's very challenging to get into that field. Uh, vet school is very competitive. It just didn't really seem like a great fit. And so I started to look for other options. But eventually I found uh, ecology and, and evolutionary biology uh, and those kinds of fields and quickly realized that that was kind of the path that I wanted to go into. So many people start out wanting to be doctors. You know, that's how a lot of people are exposed to the sciences in college is like they want to be pre-med. Um, so it sounds similar to kind of the, the veterinarian story. And, and young people don't have enough uh, concepts of all the different career paths you can take. Like I work in public health and I, I had no idea what public health was till my roommate, that was her major, like my sophomore year. And I was like, what's public health? I knew nothing about that. And there's, there's so many paths careers could take, but we just don't have enough exposure to them as young folks. And it's great that when you were in college, you got that exposure that showed you, hey, there's different paths where you can apply what you're interested in in different ways. And I'm curious, what was, uh, did you go straight to grad school right after undergrad? So I took a year off and worked in a research lab as kind of a research technician. Uh, so learned kind of the ins and outs of a scientific lab, uh, learned about kind of some projects that I could potentially work on in this field, but I didn't really have my own project per se. I was kind of working underneath a professor, uh, but I decided not to go for the master's and went straight into a PhD instead. Some programs like that if you have some research experience and some research background. Other programs really want you to have a master's first, so it kind of, it depends on your program. It depends on the person that you're going to be working with. I know one of the benefits of going straight into a PhD is they're often funded where it's a lot harder to get funding for a master's program. And so when you go straight to a PhD, you, you get that, that funding without having to, you know, front the cost of, of a master's program. However, it's, it's harder to go that route. Like you're sharing, you know, you kind of have to learn more by doing in real time faster. Um, but it sounds like you had the right foundations from the research work you did. And I'm curious, did you have research experience from undergrad as well? I did. Uh, so I actually worked in a research lab for over two and a half years. Uh, I was working in the same research facility uh, doing some, I don't want to call it like mundane tasks. Uh, it, it was definitely interesting and I learned a lot, but I do know that I was given tasks for my experience level. It's really great for you to share that kind of trajectory because I think a lot of people when they apply to a PhD, they think they need to have published stuff. You know, they're like, I haven't published anything. I haven't. And it's like, well, well you can't really yeah. do that until you have a PhD. Although there are people who, you know, they have some co-authorships on some of the research projects they've done, but that's not a prerequisite to getting into a PhD. Correct. Yeah, I uh, did not have any publications or co-authorships when I started my PhD. Just keeping in mind that you don't have to have a 4.0 GPA. Um, you don't have to have a perfect GRE score. And so even if you're concerned about some sort of aspect of your application like that, don't let it scare you into not applying. Um, you can address those potential issues with your application or things that are not quite as strong in your application in your personal statement. And 
say that it's there, say why it happened and how you have overcome those obstacles uh, in order to still be successful and still be a great candidate for the program. Some people who really struggled academically have done excellent in their career. They went and worked for five, 10 years and, um, yeah. and then they're applying for a PhD and they have all these qualifications and the GPA doesn't even matter at all. I'd also love to hear about just what your journey has been like as a woman of color in STEM in academia, if you can share a little bit about that. Uh, going to undergrad and, and having one single professor who was a Black woman was very isolating. It was very frustrating because I wasn't sure I could do it. Um, and even to this day, I, I'm still not sure that I can do it because I have imposter syndrome like many of us do. I've not been the only person of color uh, in my department, but the problem has been that I have not had very many, if any, mentors that have looked like me. Uh, we have more and more women faculty that we're hiring, but we don't have any Black women um, in our faculty, and I am hoping to become a tenure track professor. I do want to be a diverse voice uh, and show that people who look like me can be successful. That's such a beautiful thing that you're going after. And it sounds like it's been really hard to get there. It takes really having a drive and a passion for what you do to overcome those, those challenges of, of being on your own to get to where you want to go and, and be that voice and be that representation for others. So I really, I really commend you for that. Also felt that when I've been in organizations where it's predominantly um, non-people of color and I'm that voice that has to speak up on behalf of diversity for everyone, you know, setting those models and, and making it normalized that it, it should be normal for Black women to be leaders in science. You know, that should be a normalized thing. And, and seeing that model is going to be so important for your future students. And so I'm, I'm really excited that you're, you're on this journey. I do feel like our demographics, especially in STEM, are slowly changing. Um, so I am funded through a fellowship that allows me to go to an annual conference every year of people from underrepresented groups who are getting their PhDs come together. It allows us to see other people in our field and beyond that look like us who are succeeding. And every single year we have hundreds of graduates, hundreds of people getting their PhDs who are people of color. We want to be increasing the, de the diversity in the demographics of our faculty across the country. And this is one of the ways that we can do it is by funding those PhDs and making sure that they're getting all of the support that they need to be successful. Love to hear what is the name of this fellowship? Uh, I am funded through a joint fellowship with the Louisiana Board of Regents and the Southern Regional Education Board. And every single year, the SREB uh, aspect of the fellowship is part of the uh, National Institute on Teaching and Mentoring. And that conference is what brings together a whole bunch of PhD students from across the country. That's great to hear about those resources. And that's something I want to share more about is fellowships that support people in advancing in their careers. I, I've particularly done a few fellowships that are targeted at um, people of color and developing their leadership. And those have been really tremendous in giving me more confidence and helping me build my experience to then go be a, a leader in my field. And I think those kinds of things are really critical in transforming um, some of the systemic issues we have have around diversity in academia. And I'm going to share a couple statistics that I'd love to, to hear more of your thoughts on. So according to data from the National Science Foundation, from 2008 to 2017, 5% of PhD recipients were Black, 6% were Latinx, and 0.24% were Native American. And a 2019 Atlantic article also states that less than 6% of full-time faculty members at institutions across the country are Black. So, you know, like what you were sharing with um, 
with how you you only had one professor in your in your academic history that was a black woman it's it, you know that seems like it comes from the fact that we don't have that many um, people of color graduating with phds so that's part of the systemic problem and then something else i found was you know even though these are the stats currently over the last 15 years college degrees for latinx folks more than doubled and um, and college degrees for Black folks and Native Americans increased by 60%, which is amazing. And so while we're seeing that growth in college graduates, we're not seeing that growth translate to people of color being PhD recipients and faculty. Um, and so I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what are some of those systemic barriers you see facing people of color in pursuing a PhD? Oh, I think there are so many. <laughs> So there are actually a lot of PhD students who never finish. Uh, and that's definitely one of the problems that we see one of the like parts of the leaky pipeline. Um, I, I really struggle with the term leaky pipeline because in some aspects, there isn't even really a pipeline. Um, it's incredibly tough to kind of break the systemic barrier to get into graduate school because there are so many things about graduate school that we just didn't learn about growing up. Um, I have many friends, uh, non people of color who are in graduate school with me right now. And every once in a while, one of them will just mention something and it just it, it ricochets through my head when they talk about their parents getting their PhDs. And I'm reminded that there are just so many little tiny tidbits of knowledge that you get when your parents have already obtained PhDs. Uh, I mean, I am, I'm blessed in that my Caucasian mom was able to get a graduate degree. She got a master's in education. And so I already feel some semblance of privilege because she had to navigate that aspect of graduate. But going into STEM was completely new territory for me. And I have a little bit of privilege there. I cannot even fathom the unknowns that people who don't even have, uh, whose parents never even finished high school or college, the unknowns that they don't even know they don't know. And so it's something that I, I'm kind of referring to as the black box of grad school. Um, there are so many aspects of learning that grad school exists, learning how to apply for graduate school, learning how to find an advisor or mentor for a graduate school, how to fund graduate school, how to interview for positions uh, in order to go how to find funding while you're in graduate school so that you can go to conferences and share your research, which is normally something that's required of you while you're in, in graduate school. Um, there are all of these little tiny pockets of information that you have to get from somewhere. And the majority of people of color going through grad school are having to figure it out for themselves. And all of those things, all of those little pockets that I was talking about, each of those is an opportunity for a person of color to drop out because they don't know enough and can't figure out how to move past that barrier. I, I had no idea that there were larger universities out there that had interview weeks or days where they flew students out in order to talk to faculty, talk to other students. I paid for my own trip to go to my university um, for a one day, like 24 hour visit to talk to my professor because I happened to be six hours away. If I had been halfway across the country, I probably would not have even visited before going because I couldn't have financially uh, afforded to do that. And so I think the systemic barriers kind of boil down to this black box of you don't know what you don't know until honestly you're in grad school and that's the whole problem. And so there are a lot of resources out there that are trying to dismantle this black box, trying to share this information and give 
students guidelines and resources and the knowledge of how to do grad school, how to get into it and address all of these problems. It's great to hear that there are resources that are that are coming out online that are helping people understand these things. I mean, that's kind of the purpose of my YouTube channel is yeah. uh, sharing with folks a lot of that information that people just don't know. And I actually started my YouTube channel after um, my sister applied for a diversity scholarship when she was applying to Harvard for grad school. And um, the scholarship was separate than the actual grad school application. And it was to go visit Harvard. And she had a friend who had a very similar background and profile as her. And that girl did not get the the diversity scholarship. And I remember thinking like, wow, I feel so bad for that girl because you have me, like who's an expert at writing essays Mm -hmm. in this way. And that girl didn't have anyone to help her with her essay. And that felt unfair to me. And I was like, that's what made me start this YouTube channel. Like I want to put as much stuff online as possible for other people to find it. If you don't have someone in your network who knows how to write scholarship applications well or could read your work or that kind of thing. Um, And so I'm I'm so happy to hear you have more resources to share. And there are lots of things like that out there, like that Harvard Diversity Scholarship. And a lot of people don't even know, A, those things exist, and B, know how to write a compelling um, scholarship or fellowship application to then get those awards. And something I I experience a lot when I'm reading people's um, applications is, is people are way too humble and they don't know how to talk about themselves in a way that um, is compelling. And I will talk to people and I'm like, they have amazing experiences and they'll tell me about something they've done. And I'm like, what you just said to me, write that down. Like that is amazing, but they, they don't see what's amazing about themselves. And I think this yeah. is something that a lot of people of color experience where we we don't really know something we've done is special or we have that imposter syndrome. So we think it's not good enough. So we don't try. And um, I love what you're saying about peeling that black box and showing like it is possible, you know, to get into a PhD if you didn't publish anything. It is yeah. possible <laughs> to find funding and these kinds of things. It is possible to get support to go fly out for an interview. You just you have to know those things exist and see my models is how you is how you get there. So I'm available. I'm public on Twitter um, at cast the fish K A S S the fish. Um, if people want to reach out, I do check my messages um, fairly regular fairly regularly. So if people want to reach out to me there, um, I can do what I can to try to help you um, when I have time or point you in the direction of resources that I have as well. Having that mentorship, having those models is super important. So thank you so much for sharing about your journey today.